Yes, fats are good for you. They're fats that are essential in your diet. And if you're getting those fats from real food, it's fine. If you're getting those fats from processed food, ultra processed foods, it's not so fine. So we're back to eat food, not too much processed fats. Um, and that's hard for people to understand, and it's not fun. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Produced by Soapbox Media. The world needs evidence-based public policy now more than ever. Making the right decisions should not be partisan politics. Please help spread the rational view by going to patron.podbean.com slash the rational view. Together, we can make a better future. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. In this episode, I'm starting my series of interviews on the science of nutrition. And I'm going to start off at the top with an interview with a leading authority on the politics of food and nutrition, Dr. Marion Nessel. In 2011, author Michael Pollan ranked her as the number two most powerful foodie in America after Michelle Obama, and American food journalist Mark Bittman ranked her number one in his list of foodies to be thankful for. If you like what you're hearing, please press like on your podcast app. Please share it with your friends. Drop me a note on my Facebook group, The Rational View. Love to hear from you. Marion Nessel is Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health Emerita at New York University. She's also Visiting Professor of Nutritional Sciences at Cornell. She earned a PhD in Molecular Biology and an MPH in Public Health Nutrition from the University of California, Berkeley. Previous faculty positions were at Brandeis University and the UCSF School of Medicine. She was Senior Nutrition Policy Advisor in the Department of Health and Human Services and editor of the 1988 Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health. Her research and writing examines scientific and socioeconomic influences on food choice and its consequences, emphasizing the role of food industry marketing. She's the author, co-author, or co-editor of 15 books focusing on the politics and science of food. Her most recent book is a memoir, Slow Cooked, An Unexpected Life in Food Politics, in 2022. She's won numerous awards for her public outreach and has been recognized as one of the most influential foodies in America. The University of California School of Public Health at Berkeley named her as a public health hero. Dr. Nessel, welcome to The Rational View. Oh, glad to be here. Thanks for the nice introduction. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, so your your bio is is amazingly diverse and interesting. Could could you tell us a little bit about your career path? Your 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 memoir says it's an unexpected life in food politics. Why was it unexpected? Well, it wasn't planned. Um, the uh, you know, I mean, everybody asks me, "How did you get to where you are today? How did you become who you are? How do I do it?" And I hadn't planned any of this. It was. Um, Kind of what I tried to do, I think, throughout my life was to make the best of whatever circumstances I found myself in. And, you know, I'm, I'm ancient. And, the, uh, you know, when I, was a, when I was a young woman, there were very few options for women. You know, I came of age in the 1950s when um, women were expected to get married and have children and do absolutely nothing else. If they did work, um, or if we did work, it was only to support our husbands. And, uh, you know, I tried very hard to conform. I had very good instincts, but they were constantly thwarted because the possibilities were so limited. You know, I went to college at a time when there was still lockout and you couldn't leave your dorm after 10 o'clock at night. Um, I mean, it's just hard. It just was a completely different era. Um, and I was trying to conform because it was too hard not to. So I got married very young and had children very young. And then I had children to raise. And, and that was, um, 
you know, I was responsible for them uh, at a time when women didn't work and women stayed home with kids. So managing all of that was very, very difficult. Uh, and it took a long time to sort of work through that um, and get to the point where I felt like I had choices and agency. Most of the time, I didn't know for decades, I didn't think I had choices or agency. Wow. So you did a, a PhD in microbiology. Was that later in life then, after you had raised your kids, or was it earlier? Um, it was in between. I graduated from college. Uh, I took a job for two years, and then I became, I got pregnant. Um, I was married at the time I got pregnant, and then I stayed home with children for two years. Um, so I was four years out of undergraduate, which made me a little older, but not what you would consider to be later in life. I was you know, a little bit older than my peers, but not very much so. But it was unusual for women to um, go to graduate school, let alone go to graduate school in molecular biology. And it was um, you know, absolutely unheard of for somebody with two children to go to graduate school molecular biology and the um, and but I did that and I was lucky enough to get a fellowship so I could afford to pay a babysitter babysitting was e it was easier to find babysitters in those days because the financial stakes were in this day I mean this was an era when if you earned a salary of a couple of hundred dollars a month you could be fine if you had three hundred dollars a month you could be great hmm Wow. And there were two of us. So, so you know, we were financially okay. And my stipend in graduate school paid the babysitting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you went into microbiology. What what interested you in microbiology at first? Well, actually, it was molecular. And, oh, sorry, molecular. And, 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 and there's a difference. Microbiology is about bacteria, viruses, and so forth. Molecular biology is about DNA, RNA, and protein or at least it was at the time. And the I had a professor as an undergraduate. I was an undergraduate science major. And I had a professor who I had a very serious crush on. And I figured he was in molecular biology. And I figured if somebody like him was in molecular biology, that would be the exciting, interesting thing to study. Um, it was DNA, RNA, protein was kind of interesting. And DNA had just been discovered, um, or, the, or its role had just been, structure had just been discovered. And this was seemed to be at the cutting edge of biology at the time. Um, and I had very good grades as an undergraduate. I got into the program uh, just as, I got into the program in its first year. It, it, it was uh, being reconstructed from a, a distinguished vir virology program. Um, to expand into molecular biology, and I got into the program, and as I tell in the story, on my first meeting with the graduate advisor, uh, who was a little surprised at finding a woman with two small children, and my children were five months old and just under two, I mean, they were two little kids, um, he said, well, he said, you're going to get a fellowship. But the only reason that you're getting a fellowship is that we have the money because men didn't apply this year. Uh, but next year, when our program is established and we have a molecular biology program, we expect a lot of men to be applying for it. And you know, you may not get a fellowship next year. <laughs> yeah, that's how it started. And the, you know, I did get the fellowship the next year, even though men did apply because I did okay. I was very good at getting good grades in classes. That was an early skill. Um, and I got my degree. Um, I, you know, I don't think it was an earth-shaking, it wasn't an earth-shaking project. Uh, and I heard all the time I was in graduate school about how it wasn't an earth-shaking project. But I got it done. And the... Um, and as I like to say, I'm a lapsed molecular biologist um, because I was a nucleic acid enzymologist before there were restriction enzymes. I mean, I can't even say it with a straight face. It was such a long time ago, and the field has changed so much. Wow. Okay. And you went from that then into the field of public health. How did 
How did you unexpectedly fall into that uh, Oh, no, position? this is a long story. <laughs> uh, this is a long story. I went from uh, graduate school at Berkeley to a postdoctoral position at Brandeis University, and I was there for eight years. Um, and then I went to the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, and I was there for 10 years. And then I did a public health degree. I oh, mean, okay. as I said, this is a, this is a very long, drawn-out story. Um, I went to public health school because I, I lost my job at uh, UCSF. Just at, I was fired, essentially, just at the time that my marriage was breaking up, and I didn't know what to do. And I had no, I was teaching nutrition to medical students, but I didn't have a license to do that. I didn't have a degree in nutrition. I didn't have um, any kind of document that said that I knew anything about it. I'm largely self-taught. Um, and so I went to public health school basically to get a nutrition degree. Turned out to be a terrific thing to do because I turned out to think like a public health person. I think in terms of behavioral uh, and a societal determin determinants of health, the way in which society affects people's ability to stay healthy. I think that way automatically. Um, so it turned out to be a really good fit. And then that led to the job in Washington two years later, and that led to the job at NYU, uh, where I've been ever since. But it took a long time to get there. That's a long path. Uh but you've obviously been very successful. So that's the title of your memoir, and that and that's that's the the genesis of it, the the long path. Yeah, I, it, it took me a very very long time to figure out what I really wanted to work on, how to work on it, and how to make it work. Um, and that didn't happen until I came to NYU, um, where NYU is a very unusual university, as far as I can tell. And it turned out to be a terrific fit for me um, because the university values the kinds of things that I like to do. And so it was fun. You know, I, had a, I had a good time here, I have to say. Excellent. So you recently published uh, an op-ed on the FDA's recent announcement uh, of a set of rules it proposes to enforce for food manufacturers to claim that a food product is quote unquote healthy. And uh, in your, in your op-ed, you state the proposed rules are a lot better than the labeling anarchy that currently exists. How, how bad is the current situation in food labeling? Can you give us some, some examples or some, some insight into where, where we are right now? Well, the healthy uh, proposal is to put a front of package label on uh, on packages to indicate whether um, packet whether processed foods are high in salt, sugar, and saturated fat, uh, which are the things you're supposed to be eating less of. And the um, the food manufacturing industry, uh, now called the Consumer Brands Association, formerly the Grocery Manufacturers of America. Uh, some years ago, when the FDA was interested in doing this, more than 10 years ago, the FDA had a proposal for how to do this. Uh, you know, the prototype for this is a traffic light, red, green, yellow. If it's got a red dot on it, don't eat it. If it's yellow, you know, you can eat it sometimes. And if it's green, you can eat as much of it as you want. Obviously, the food industry doesn't want anything like this because those red dots would go on lots and lots and lots of processed foods, and processed foods are among the most profitable that they make, because you can buy the ingredients, then they're cheap, stick them in a box, and put the box on the shelf for a long time. Um, and also, they're formulated to make people like them really a lot. So the, um, the food industry opposes any kind of rating system like that, and countries in Latin America and in Europe have started using front package labeling schemes that tell consumers at a glance whether this is something you should buy or not buy. In Latin America, the labels are don't buy. In uh, Europe, they're a little bit more complicated. They're graded A through E. 
um, and A is good and E is bad. But the, um, the, the FDA is putting a positive label on it. So if, uh, if these processed foods meet certain criteria for salt, sugar, and fat, then they can have a healthy label on them. Um, I think the whole thing is really silly, but it's uh, because hardly any of these, hardly any foods will um, qualify. And it's, you know, does anybody pay any attention to these things? I'm not sure. But the grocery manufacturers, when the FDA tried to do it before, put on their own set of guidelines. And those are those little teeny boxes um, that you see about, I mean, nobody even looks at them, but they're on the front of um, many, many packaged food labels. I see that I've got one right here. I, I mean, I can show it to you if you want to see it. But sure, it's, yeah. Um, oh. I loved this box. It was put out by Kellogg's during Gay Pride Week. But it's these little things on the bottom that the grocery that the grocery manufacturers put in, so the FDA would not put on anything that was easier to understand. So there's some little icons in the on the bottom of looks like a, a fruity cereal box here. Yeah, nobody looks at them. Nobody pays any attention to them. And the and that's why the FDA is continuing to try to uh, develop some kind of front of package labeling system that would replace this, or maybe it would be in addition to this. I don't know. Um, anyway, I collect cereal boxes. That's one of my collections. Interesting. Um, yeah. So you know, I'm coming at this kind of new. I don't know a lot about the food industry. I'm a, I'm a physicist by by background, and I'm just trying to, you know understand all of the all of the directives on food because we get so many directives that you know fat is bad or sugar is bad or salt is bad everything is bad alcohol is bad everything you like is bad so i want to get dig down to what this you know talk to the experts and learn what the science really says and and you know who we should listen to because i don't think a lot of people trust the manufacturers to put the proper labels on these boxes i mean we, we have these these uh percent daily allowances on the ingredients of the of the box you know you, you can see if you look at at salt for example you know most of your processed foods seem to have 50 plus percent of your daily allowance of salt in them and it's like is this something we should be worried about and i've heard um people you know who've investigated the the science or, or read things in the news or exposés you know at at the news level at the popular level that say yes Salt is bad for you if you have high blood pressure or, or a heart condition, but otherwise you probably don't need to worry about it. And I'm skeptical. I, I'm so I'm coming to you. What are the things that we have to be worried about in processed foods? What are the worst things that 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 will kill you or that will cause disease or or make you fat? Well, let me start from sort of a basic principle. Dietary advice is really very simple. It's so simple that the journalist Michael Pollan can do it in seven words. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. If that's what you do, and you're eating real food, and balancing the amount of food you eat with the amount of activity that you uh, generally use, you're doing fine, and you don't have to worry about it. And eat food, not too much, mostly plants. leaves enormous amounts of room for eating what you like, um, for having delicious meals, for enjoying it with friends, for doing all kinds of things. Uh, most people don't eat that way because the one um, thing that you need to understand about the eat food not too much, mostly plants, is that when he says food, he means foods that is not that that are not what are now called ultra processed, meaning industrially produced, um, can't make them in home kitchens, have all kinds of additives that um, you can't get in supermarkets and are formulated to be irresistibly delicious. Uh, so you can't stop eating them. And there's now an enormous amount of evidence that people who eat a lot of processed foods are at higher risk for weight gain and for everything that weight gain is risk factor for, like type 2 diabetes, heart disease, cancer, premature mortality, COVID-19, you name it. Um, so very simple you know so then where does when you start asking about salt 
you're really asking about how much processed foods people are eating because that's where the salt is in American diets. It's not the salt that you add at the salt shaker or the salt that you put into your pasta when you're cooking pasta. It's the amount that's already in processed foods and restaurant foods. Um, so from a processed food manufacturer, they can't sell processed food unless it's got a lot of sodium in it. Um, sodium is part of salt, sodium chloride is salt. They can't sell it. Um, and they can't sell processed food unless it's very sweet. So the sugar and the, uh, and the salt are in the processed foods because otherwise people won't buy them. And so there's a lot of food industry resistance to uh, taking the salt and the sugar out. Um, so, you know, they've tried and they can shave it a little bit. And, you know, I'm sort of curious to look at, I'm going to look at this cereal again. Since we're talking about it, I'm going to look at the, um, I'm going to look at the nutrition facts label and read them. This cereal has 12 grams of sugar uh, in the cereal itself. And if you have it with milk, it turns out to be 21 grams of sugar and 12 grams are added sugars. It's the added sugars that we're concerned about. 12 grams is um, almost a tablespoon per serving. So that's a fair amount. It also has 200 milligrams of sodium in the cereal per serving and 280 if you add milk to it. So some sodium is naturally present in food, but this sodium is all added. So you want to, these are processed foods and they have a lot of that stuff in there. Um, so that part of what you want to do is to minimize the consumption of processed food. This doesn't mean, minimize doesn't mean never eat it. It means try not to eat too much of it. Um, and, you know, and to get back to your question about salt, everybody um, needs to worry about salt because blood pressure increases with age anyway as arteries get stiffer. And salt makes the blood pressure worse. And, it's, it's, and the high blood pressure is a big pain. So you've got to take drugs for it. Um, so the, um, I think, you know, I, the, the thing about salt is that it's in, the, it's in processed foods and restaurant foods and that you develop a taste for it. Um, one of the reasons why it's so high in restaurant foods is that chefs get used to using a lot of salt and the food doesn't taste good to them unless it has a lot of salt in it. For somebody like me who tries to eat a low salt diet, I find restaurant foods too salty. There, I've gotten used to a lower salt diet. Food tastes very salty to me if it has a lot of salt in it, uh, and I, I don't, I don't particularly like it. So it's easy to, I, I think it's easy to get used to a lower salt diet, and you can do that if you're not eating a lot of processed foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I've heard a lot of. Um the the talk about um nutrition and food talking about processed foods ultra processed foods versus quote unquote real foods and as a scientist that sounds like rhetoric it sounds like kind of a, an appeal to nature fallacy i just want to you know just the the act of processing the food isn't the problem right the problem is the additives that are typically placed into the food in the processing the excess salt the excess sugar is what you're demonizing when you're talking about ultra processed foods. Is that correct? Well, I'm not saying it's just the, no, it's more complicated than that. Ultra processed foods are a specific category of, of, of processed foods. I mean, all foods are processed in one, in some way or another, if you're buying them in a grocery store. The easiest example is corn on the cob is unprocessed. Um, canned corn is minimally processed, and Doritos are ultra processed. Mm, uh, Doritos I like Doritos. Additives. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody, everybody does. Everybody does. I mean, that's the whole point. You're supposed to adore them. And if you have a bag of them in front of you, you can't stop eating them. That's their purpose. So these are industrially produced foods that you couldn't make in your home kitchen. I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing there's something about them that um 
makes people eat more calories. There's very, very good evidence for that, that if people are put on two different kinds of diets, one ultra-processed foods and one generally processed foods, they eat more calories, a lot more calories from the ultra-processed because they eat faster. Um, they find the foods just irresistibly delicious, can't stop eating them. Um, and the uh, man, there's a third thing that's just been shown. Oh, they're very, they, they're very high in calories for the amount of food that you eat. And there's something about that that we're biologically programmed to really like. You know, we're biologically programmed to avoid starvation. We are not biologically programmed to avoid overeating in the way that our food system is set up now. Uh, so there's the bio, that's why everybody overeats. You know, the food is so expensive, it's readily available. We're not out hunting, hunting and gathering anymore. Sure, sure. So, so the, the, the big, the big bad things are the sodium, the salt, and the sugar. No, the processing, the industrial processing has a lot to do with it. The hyper palatability, it's called. Tell me, tell me about that a little bit more, because I'm not familiar with what that is. Well, they're, they're formulated so that you can't stop eating them. And it's a combination of flavors and textures. Some of those are due to additives, um, chemical additives of one kind or another. Some of it has to do with the way their industrial production takes place. Um, and some of it has to do with salt, sugar, and fat, and the combination of them. But these foods are tested. In focus group testing, I mean, they're tested extensively to make sure that they're, they're just, there's something called a bliss point is the, um, is the term that's used, just the precise amount of salt, sugar, and texture that just makes it so you just absolutely adore them. And everybody has junk foods that just absolutely love, you know, you, and so the, the trick is, if you've got these foods that you love, buy them in small packages. You know, if you can't stop eating them, buy them in small packages. Well, the industry is helping us with that in uh, shrinkflation. Uh, well, you keep getting are. smaller packages with That's less food right. in them. And <laughs> and at the same price. Right. At the same price. Yeah, we, we keep seeing the, the the children bring home these little chip packages from Halloween trick or treating, and there's there's like you know fewer and fewer chips in them every year, <laughs> but more air. <laughs> that's helpful. I'm for it. Okay, okay, that's um, good. So, throughout your career, you've uh, focused a lot on the politics of nutrition and and the interactions between the lobbying and the government rec recommendations. How is the politics and, and lobbying influence popular thinking about nutrition to go against the scientific evidence? Is that something that we have to look out for? That we're being fooled by the lobbyists? Absolutely. I mean, the food industry follows the cigarette industry's playbook to the letter. So if you have a product that, you know, and there's increasing concern that these foods are encouraging people to overeat and gain weight and in the United States, 74% of American adults, three quarters, the vast majority of American adults are overweight or obese by Centers for Disease Control standards. Um, if you're going to do this, if you're going to have products that do this, um, you want to make sure the government doesn't do any nasty regulation that's going to reduce sales of these products because if you're a food company you're not a social service agency you're not a public health agency you're a business and your job is to produce profits for stockholders that's your job um so you don't want anything to happen that's going to reduce the possibility of making profits and making your stockholders happy so one of the things that food companies do is to fund research and by the most extraordinary coincidence, research that's funded by industry comes out with results that favor the industry's interest. Most of the time, no, but most of the time. What a coincidence. I'm sure they're not motivated to publish the stuff that doesn't favor them. Uh, they're not motivated to publish it, but sometimes they, it is published. It's just very, very hard to find. 
Um, I, I write a daily blog at foodpolitics.com. And every Monday I post something about industry-funded research. I never have trouble finding them. Each one is funnier than the next because if I see the title of a study, my first uh, with you know, this, uh, my first question is, "Oh, who paid for this?" Um, and I'm often right. Or if I know who funded a study, I can predict what the results are. Um, not all the time, but most of the time. And some of them are just very, very amusing. And there's been a lot of research to explain how this happens. It's not that researchers are bought, um, at least not in any direct way. They um, do, and it's not that the science is bad. They do the science. A lot of it has to do with the way the research question is asked and with unconscious bias of which the researchers are completely unaware and will deny in their dying breath that they are influenced by food industry funding when all of the evidence shows this remarkable coincidence. Hmm. So that, that, that's, that's a good claim, though, to, to know that the researchers themselves are not being unscrupulous or, or you know, uh, shading the evidence. They are, uh, the, the questions that they're asking are designed to give positive results effectively for the food. Well, let me give an, let me give an example. Um, and the, the people who are funding the research set it up this way for the most part. So I get letters all the time from food industry trade associations saying, we have $50,000 and we're going to, uh, we have lots of $50,000 and we're going to fund studies uh, that will demonstrate the benefit of our product. That's how it's phrased. They're not going to fund studies that are unlikely to show benefit. Right. So researchers, researchers who think that the product is okay, and this is often for fruits and vegetables and grains that are perfectly okay to eat. You know, they're real foods. Um, they will uh, ask for. Um, studies that will demonstrate benefit, and the only ones they're going to fund are the ones that have a really good chance of showing benefit. You know, and then if you happen to come out with a study that you don't that doesn't show benefit, your probability of getting funded again is pretty small. Because why would they do that? It's um, so lots of the research that gets published and it gets into the press. Um, is industry funded, and sometimes the articles will say so, but often they don't. So, you're you're definitely coming out very strongly against the the food processing industry. Are there any healthy processed foods out there that? Oh. So oh. it's not a it's not a blanket. Everything Ooh. processed is bad. There are some that are better than others, and some I assume that are healthy for you. It's the ultra process that you want to stay away from. Those are the ones that you want to stay away from. Process, every, foods are processed. Um, and ultra processed foods don't include canned or frozen foods. They don't include a lot of things that, you know, I mean, the example that I like to use is that if you can, ice cream that you make in your home kitchen, that's not ultra processed. Ice cream that has a whole lot of added ingredients to it that you buy in a supermarket is, there's a difference. And there's somehow some kind of difference in the way that the taste the, or whatever it is that controls how much you eat responds to it in different ways. And there's something just more satisfying about whole foods. Or as one person said, gee, I don't know anybody who overeats salads. <laughs> it's really, it's really easy to overeat a bag of potato chips or a bag of cookies. It's really easy, mm -hmm. and they do give you a lot of calories. They give you a lot of calories. Yeah. One one question that I've come up against, uh, and I and I've heard um, stories about um, lobbying, influencing public against uh, fat in favor of sugar. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I don't really have the, the, the straight goods on this story, but what I'm, my understanding is that the sugar lobby basically said that fat is bad for you. You should eat sugar. And people have said, okay, well, this is wrong. Um, fat has high calorie content, but eating fatty foods is not necessarily bad for you. There are certain particular types of trans fats or saturated fats that are bad for you, but the rest are not. Is that, is that correct? Well, let's go back to eat food not too much mostly plants. Let's keep that in mind. Um, what that story refers to is a study that came out in the 1970s, late 60s, 1970s, um, in which the sugar industry um, sponsored a study. I know the study well because I wrote the editorial for the paper that described the problem. And the results of the study showed a correlation between high fat diets and high sugar diets and coronary heart disease. Both were both. And the, the paper concluded that fat was a more important problem than sugar. It was a study that was sponsored by the, the, the study was sponsored by the sugar industry, although it didn't disclose that. It didn't have to at the time. Um, so that's a, an example of sugar industry behind the scenes trying to manipulate um, public opinion and professional opinion that there was nothing wrong with sugar. And an enormous, the FDA did an enormous study in the 1980s and published it as a book that showed that sugar was not an independent risk factor for chronic disease. It didn't really show up as an independent risk factor until people started gaining weight. The really sharp rise in obesity that occurred starting in 1980, between 1980 and 2000, there was a really, really sharp rise in the prevalence of obesity. And it was at that time that everybody started taking a much tougher look at sugar. But any time that you try to look at a single nutrient like sugar or fat or these days protein, um, you're taking, you're, you're doing reductive science. You're reducing the uh, effect of whole diets to one particular nutrient. I don't really like those studies. I don't think it matters that, that yes, fats are good for you. They're fats that are essential in the diet. And if you're getting those fats from real food, it's fine. If you're getting those fats from processed food, ultra-processed foods, it's not so fun. So we're back to eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, and that's hard for people to understand, and it's not fun. So there are huge battles about fat versus carbohydrates. They don't make any sense to me at all, because uh, weight is about calories. And it doesn't matter where the calories come from. It really doesn't. The evidence is very clear on that point. If you're overeating calories, you're going to gain weight. Now, different people will gain weight at different rates. But everybody who eats more calories than they're expending in physical activity, no matter where those calories come from, is going to gain weight. The question is how much. And the variation in individuals is quite great, which, which is one of the reasons why uh, nutrition research is so complicated. It's really hard to answer a lot of questions in nutrition because you can't lock people up that we're not experimental animals. You can't lock us up in a metabolic ward and feed us defined diets for 30 years to see what happens. Um, and it's one of the reasons why the studies at the National Institute of Health are so important. It's one of the few places in the country where there's still a metabolic ward where you can lock people up for a month and do these kinds of experiments, which is why that ultra-process um, diet study was so important. It was done in a metabolic ward. Nobody could cheat. Ah, okay. You know, if you, if you do studies on people who are out in the community, they're going to be eating. You know, you, you can say, we want you to eat this kind of a diet, but they're going to eat what they're going to eat. And people are not very, um, how can I say this politely? Um, people are not very cognizant of what they're eating. 
They lie. Or to put it more politely, they can't remember. Uh, and they differentially can't remember. So uh, they remember eating more. If they think that, you know, that they remember more about eating healthfully than that than unhealthfully. It's one of the great problems in nutrition research is you can't lock people up. That's the hardest part of science is, is controlling your variables, right? And that's, I think that's why people want to reduce it to a single thing at a time. Because you can control it though, absolutely. And it's why those studies at NIH that are being done by Kevin Hall and his colleagues are so important because they can control what people are eating. They can't do it for more than a month because nobody can stand being locked up for that long. Um, but, you know, I, nutrition research is really intellectually challenging. You know, everybody thinks it's just really sloppy, but it's not deliberately sloppy. It's, it's just hard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hard to control people. Hard to control. The, so... The obesity epidemic that you mentioned between 1980 and, and 2000 being the inflection point, um, what do you think caused that? I mean, what, how, is it more prevalence of ultra-processed foods or changes in, in how the foods are being prepared? or what, you know, what, What's really behind that? Neoliberal capitalism <laughs> is my answer to that in two ways. In two ways, I mean, I say that facetiously, but in, but in two ways. Starting in 1980, uh, I can only describe it for the United States, but um, you sound Canadian, which is why I'm saying that. The, uh, Very good, you're right. Uh, uh, the um, the um, uh, you know, President Reagan was elected with a de with a deregulatory agenda, and a lot of things got deregulated during that period. And in 1980, so that was one problem. And then in the, a lot of controls on food industry, marketing and other kinds of things kind of disappeared. Um, and then in 1981, Jack Welch, who was the head of General Electric, kicked off big time the shareholder value movement, which was a movement among stockholders to get immediate higher returns on investment. And... What that meant was that instead of having blue chip stocks that gave you what, like IBM, that gave long term, slow returns, uh, there was just a huge push to cut costs and increase profits. And the, um, that was difficult for all corporations. But for food corporations, it was devastating because what happened in between the 1970s and the mid late 1980s uh, was a, an increase in the number of calories available in the food supply from about 3,200 a day on average, and that's for every man, woman, and baby in the country, to 4,000 cal calories on average. And 4,000 is just about twice what the country needs on average. Um, so that meant there was twice as much food available in the food supply as was needed by the population, a huge increase, and the food industry had to sell foods in that environment. So their choices were they could get people to choose their product instead of somebody else's, or they could get people to eat more in general, or they could raise prices, or they could get people to eat more in general. And what they did was to set up an environment in which they in which it was easier for people to eat more in general. And the easiest, uh, the food was cheap because supply and demand, there was a lot of food and more than anybody needed. So restaurants could or offer bigger portions. Uh, foods could come in bigger portions. Bigger portions have more calories. <laughs> um, the um, food appeared in places where it had never appeared before bookstores, libraries, clothing stores, food was everywhere. If food is in front of you, people will buy it. Uh, there was a big push to uh, fund research to demonstrate that snacking helped people control weight, when in fact, the more you snack, the more calories you eat. So snack became prevalent. There was uh, more eating in cars. Uh, there was more eating everywhere. 
and it became socially acceptable to eat at all times of day, anywhere, in very large portions. More calories. That's very interesting. I wasn't expecting you to say neoliberalism. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I never talked about that. Five, five years ago, I would never have said that. But now everybody gets it. If the COVID pandemic did anything, it was to demonstrate to everybody uh, what capitalism is about. Because there were so many inequities that showed up as a result of the COVID pandemic. So um, I find, you know, it used to be that I, in talking about it made people really uncomfortable. Now, if I don't talk about it, people yell at me. Why are you talking <laughs> about capitalism? Well, yes. The need for profits and for food companies, it was just so hard because they because it's so competitive. It, you know, there's still 4,000 calories a day available per capita, and food companies have to sell what they make. So they're always looking for ways to sell. And one way is to make irresistibly delicious ultra-processed foods. Mm. Yeah, so this is this is a accumulation of ever increasing uh, margins in food <laughs> growth, growth of the waistline of the of the nation. Exactly, and it's really hard for individuals to fight that. Uh, I mean, for one thing, food is about available everywhere, and also the cheapest foods are the ultra processed foods. So, you know, I mean, if poor people are complaining that fruits and vegetables are too expensive, it's because they are. Hmm. You know, and that has to do with federal policies and what gets subsidized and what doesn't, um, and, you know, all of those kinds of things. And it also plays back into the rising cost of energy, which is another one of my yeah. favorite topics. Uh, for good reason. Yeah. So uh, you are now, uh, you have a book, a memoir, Slow Cooked. Could you tell us a little bit about about your memoir, and is it just been published? It was published in October, um, and you know, it came out in an academic press that I've, I've had several books published with. Um, I wrote it because of the pandemic. Uh, I you know, couldn't do that. I write non-fiction books about food politics that are very heavily referenced. I couldn't get into a library. I couldn't get into my office. I couldn't get into any of my supporting materials. Um, so I thought, okay, this is an opportunity to, and I was sequestered upstate New York. Um, and, you know, I got out of the city. And I thought, well, this is an opportunity to sit back and reflect and try to answer the questions that I get asked all the time. You're asking some of them. Um, which is, how did this happen? How did you get interested in food? How did you get interested in nutrition? How did you get interested in the food industry? How do you feel about that? You know, I mean, this whole set of questions about how did you become you? Uh, and then also a question that I get asked a lot, um, how do I become you? You know, from students who want to do advocacy, because food is a wonderful way to do advocacy around health issues, environmental issues, and a lot of energy issues, or all, just about anything else that you can think of. Food is a great way to get into that and to um, explain to people how the system works, because everybody eats, so everybody gets it. Everybody gets it pretty quickly. So that's what I did. I started writing it during the pandemic, and... Um, it came out while the pandemic was still going on. I hope stopping. Still going on. Still going on, um, but I hope at least you know, going down a little bit. And the um, and in it, I describe and I start from my. It's not a biography. Biography is about fact. Memoir is about what you remember. Big difference. And I, I describe this as my first work of fiction. <laughs> um, okay. It's how I remember it. And so I start from my childhood because I think the childhood has a big influence on what happens as an, as an adult. I thought I needed to explain why it took me so long 
to start doing the kind of work I do, which I didn't really start until I was in my 60s. Um, you know, with a slow cook. That's inspiring. Slow cook. Um, and the, you know, my career has been for the last 20 years. And um, as I said, I'm not young. <laughs> yeah. um, although I am having a very good time, I have to say. The, um, so I, you know, how did all that happen? What were the main events? I've got lots of stories in there. Um, and, you know, I was a woman of the 50s. For people, for women now, you can just hardly imagine what that was like. Not that women don't have problems now, but the problems then were much more stark. And, you know, and so I tell the sort of women's issues along the way. I've already told you one of them, but... You know, there was another one when I was at Brandeis, and I was hired as a postdoctoral fellow and uh, discovered in the most entertaining way that some a newly hired man was making a third more than I was in salary, and we were doing exactly the same job. Um, and I found out about it and, we, um, and spent a year saying the same thing over and over and over again. I don't want to make a federal case of this. And I didn't. And eventually it got fixed. But it was, you know, I was told, first of all, salaries are none of your business. And second of all, he's paid more because he's, a get to, he's about to get married and they're thinking of having children. Therefore, he needs more money. I said, but I already have two children. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> um, and yeah, so I mean that kind of thing, and then um, yeah, wow. and then a lot about the food politics stuff when I was in Washington, which I thought was really interesting to recount. And then I um, went to NYU to chair a home economics department. <laughs> that was pretty entertaining too. <laughs> it's not home, it's not home economics anymore. <laughs> So it was once called the Home Economics Department, and now it's... When I, uh, yeah, it was called home, econo home Economics and Nutrition. Now it's Nutrition and Food Studies. Okay. Big difference. Okay, interesting. Difference. So we're, we're getting towards the end of our, our time slot here. Uh, I have one more question for you. If you had the power to change just, just one thing in the current food regulation system, what would you, what would you change? Oh, I have to do two things. No. First of all, I would get rid of Citizens United, which is the uh, law that um, allows unlimited secret funds from corporations to pay for election campaigns. One of the problems with food regulation is that uh, corporations vanish. Uh, so that would be one. And the other would be to change the way Wall Street evaluates um, food corporations and to insist that social values be part of what corporations are expected to do. You know, it seems like it's removed from um, the immediacy of food regulation, but the food regulation is impossible in a situation in which there's unlimited campaign contributions, secret ones, and the, um, and the shareholder value movement is still in play. There's lip service to get rid of the shareholder value movement, but so far it's still good service. Hmm. Those are very, uh, very wise ideas, I think. Um, definitely the, the problems with, with campaign financing of uh, corporations is, is something that, that impacts all of democracy. Precisely. It's, it's difficult to have uh, equality when, when that sort of thing buys buys regulations so thank you very much for for coming on the show and, and and giving us an introduction to to food and nutrition science and and regulation uh really appreciate you taking the time for taking the time i'm gonna i'll send you a rational view t-shirt so you can you can get oh, some merch I want one. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on i appreciate it thanks for having me If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page 
at patron.podbean.com slash The Rational View. Thanks for listening.